Today we're going to talk about Bible study and meditation, and again, I, it, it's set up as though there were two different things. Well, they really are part of the same process. There are uh, discrete ways in which we talk about them, but Bible study and meditation, next week prayer and journaling, fasting and simplicity, worship and confession, service and stewardship, silence and solitude, and then conclusion, uh, practicing the disciplines, and a final exam. So that's our schedule. Um, the real issues we want to get at in this class um, address the question of how we as Christians, that is, as saved people who are washed by the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus, and we are saved by the sacrifice and miraculous resurrection of Jesus, how are we now, in the early years of the 21st century, how are we supposed to be living our lives as Christians? Another way to think about that is what does it really mean to be a Christian in terms of how we live our lives, in the sense of what does it mean to be a mature Christian? Anybody can be a baby Christian for their whole life. But what does it mean to be a mature Christian? That after we're saved, we can grow in our faith and in our relationship with God to live out our salvation in very practical ways in fulfillment of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's not just get saved and then be a slacker for the rest of your, you know, your life on earth. There should be something more to it than that. And so the question we asked last week, the real question about the spiritual disciplines, is how does one live the spirit-filled life promised by Jesus in the New Testament? Now, I should note, when I say spirit-filled there, that's not a charismatic reference, necessarily. Spirit, uh, if for the Pentecostal and charismatic Christians, to say spirit-filled means the expression of the spiritual gifts, especially, most often, the speaking in tongues. That may be an expression of having the Holy Spirit more active in your life, but that's not specifically what we're talking about. We're talking about how we can have the kind of spiritual life relationship with God, how we can become more like Jesus, um, in our Christian walk today, and that's another way of saying that, is to be more spirit-filled, that the Spirit is manifesting uh, through us, uh, making us more like Jesus, and making us closer to God the Father. Now the real point is, it doesn't matter if you are 30, or 50, or 70, or 90, or 22, whether you are new to the Christian faith, or you've been a Christian for many years, you are never too old or too young to be spiritually immature. <laughs> I know people in their 80s that are really immature spiritually. No, I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> but the thing we need to realize is that the same way that we're never too old to be spiritually mature, we also are never too old to grow in our spiritual maturity. We can gain maturity in our spiritual life simply by um, some of the practices that we're talking about. The point is that there are ways in which we can assert ourselves to grow in our love for God and our love for other people. Remember, Jesus said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So one definition of Christian maturity is that we are growing in our love for God, which implies relationship with God, and we also are growing in our love for other people. So that's much of what we're talking about. How do we grow in our maturity, grow in our love for God and for other people, and become more like Jesus? Now, I can assure you, based upon not only my experience in life, but the experience of the church for 2,000 years, that it is definitely possible for us to grow in Christian maturity. And it may not even be as hard as you think, but it does require some effort on your part. Your part. You do have to, we do have to, uh, focus ourselves in order to have this happen. Nothing happens without some focus of energy and concentration and discipline. That's why these are called the spiritual disciplines. And so, yes, it does require some effort on our part, but we have been assured by Scripture that as we focus ourselves, as we give a relatively modest amount of effort compared to the effort we expend for everything else in our lives, we can grow closer to the Lord. It involves practicing the kinds of spiritual disciplines that we're talking about in this class. And these disciplines have been proven for 2,000 years. They have been since, really, the time of Jesus. Um, we talked last week about the fact that Jesus demonstrated in the Gospels things like fasting and solitude and silence and prayer, all the disciplines of the faith. And so um, we know from Jesus on, through the whole 2,000 years of the church, that these things work. And when we say spiritual discipline, what we really are talking about, and I gave you a couple of definitions last week, this is the one we'll focus on, the spiritual disciplines are practices that we willingly pursue in response to a God who created us, 
saved us and guides us. <laughs> Spiritual disciplines draw us closer to God, deepen our understanding of who He is, and help us into and make us into the men and women He desires us to become. That's what the spiritual disciplines are. Now, as we begin today, I, I'm going to, each week I'm going to sort of relay that foundation because it gives us a context for the specifics. Today we want to specifically talk about the single most important way in which you can grow closer to God as well as grow in your love for other people. And that is the study of God's primary relation to us, which is His Word in Scripture. I... The influence and impact that the Word of God in Scripture has had down through history is nothing else even comes close. The Bible as we know it has done more to affect Western culture especially uh, than any other single factor. The Constitution of the United States, the Magna Carta, the, you know, no matter what you want to pick, nothing comes close to the impact and effect that the Bible has had on individual lives as well as on the culture and society of the Western world. And I want to give you a few quotes here. Chuck Colson, we referred to him in Bible study this morning, someone who came to the Lord in prison, founded Prison Fellowship. Colson said, The Bible, banned, burned, beloved, more widely read, more frequently attacked than any other book in history. Generations of intellectuals have attempted to discredit it. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it. Yet soldiers carry it into battle, believing it more powerful than their weapons. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle saints. One of the things we always need to remember is that the Bible is something that people for the last 2,000 years especially, in the Christian era, have given their lives for. People who were martyred in order to be able to translate it into languages people can understand or to import it into countries where it wasn't allowed. There are places that's still happening today. The recognition of the importance and power of the Bible is unparalleled. A few other quotes. This one from William Jennings Bryant. The Bible holds up before us ideals that are within sight of the weakest and the lowliest, lowliest and yet so high that the best and the noblest are kept with their faces turned ever upward. It carries the call of the Savior to the remotest corners of the earth, on its pages are written the assurances of the present and our hopes for the future. From Henry Ward Beecher, who was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher was a very significant uh, minister in his day. He said, the Bible is God's chart for you to steer by, to keep you from the bottom of the sea and to show you where the harbor is and how to reach it without running on rocks and bars. Bars meaning like sand bars, not Tom's bar. <laughs> Although that probably is true. Uh, from Abraham Lincoln. I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good of the Savior of the world is communicated to us through the book. But for it, we could not know right from wrong. That's something that I've heard before when I talk about, you know, God's revelation in Scripture as being so important. People say, well, what about His revelation in Jesus? Well, absolutely. But where do we hear? Where do we learn of? Where do we grow in the truth of God's revelation in the incarnate Christ? It's through this book. So, He reflects the truth to us by the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ through this written book. It's not to say it replaces Jesus. We're not saved by the Bible. We are saved by Jesus Christ. But we are led to Jesus and informed of him through this book. And then Matthew Arnold, no relation as far as I know. To the Bible men will return. And why? Because they cannot do without it. Okay. Um, a slide that I've used in a number of classes is this one. Four characteristics of what we believe about the Bible. And then I'm going to talk about uh, Bible reading and study and whatnot. We believe that the Bible is revealed. Jeremiah 30 says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. And by the way, you do remember that all these things are available online. All of these PowerPoint uh, slides are available to you online. So, uh, The second point we would make about the Bible, about Scripture, is that it is inspired. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, and woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We believe that the Bible is authoritative, that it has authority for our lives. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, 
that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. It is the authority of scripture that our faith is built upon and its testimony in Jesus Christ. And then fourth, we believe that the word of God is living. And this cut off a little bit, this is Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is, act, is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Again, if you've been in some of the other classes, you've seen this slide several times because I've used this as sort of to lay the foundation of the high, uh, both the high value and the high expectation we put in the scripture as the word of God. Okay? Now, let's get into it a little bit. I said earlier that today we're talking about the single most important way for you to go grow closer to God, to grow in your spiritual maturity. Willow Creek Church in Illinois, I think some of you know Willow Creek, it's one of the largest churches in America, uh, they did a survey of 250,000 church attenders from a thousand different churches, and they asked them in-depth questions about their faith, about their church experience, about what they wanted or needed from church, and what had helped them most in their Christian lives. And interestingly, they broke this 250,000 people up into seekers, people who had not yet made a profession of faith, people who were young Christians, people who were sort of middle-aged Christians in terms of their faith, and those who were very mature in the faith. And evaluated all of these factors, um, what, what had had the most impact on them in their Christian life, according to those different groups. And that survey identified that the practice that had, was most critical in the lives of people and helping them grow in their faith was about anything else the Word of God. Now they considered things like attending Sunday services, being in a small group, taking classes at church, praying, tithing, journaling, serving others through the church, all manner of kind of church activity and Christian activity. But the most important spiritual practice, the thing that helped people grow most in their Christian maturity, and the only practice that was considered on the list of most important activities for spiritual growth for all Christians in all categories was listening to God by re reading and reflecting on His Word, the Bible. That is, reading and studying and meditating on the Bible as God's Word in revelation to us. That was the most significant point. Yeah. Unequivocally, there was, no, there was no if about it. That was the most important. I personally, and I'm sure some of you as well, could attest to the significance that studying God's Word has on your own spiritual growth. Um, in the time of my life, and I, I was Christian for a lot of years before I actually got disciplined about reading God's Word. From the time in which I dedicated, started dedicating time every day to read God's Word and to study it on a regular basis, I have my faith has changed fundamentally in terms of my assurance of God's presence with me, a clarity of what my purpose is, and so many other things that are a reflection of the fact that my relationship with God is true. Now, today I want us to dig into what that means for all of us, that the Bible can be such a critical uh, part of our own spiritual growth. To get us into that, I've chosen two texts that I want us to look at initially. I've got a bunch of other scripture we'll talk about later. Because if I can't point to scripture to show you why scripture is important, then I'm missing something. Okay. The first text I want to look at is from the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. I'm very specific in saying I want to look at one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament here. Uh, sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, starting with the fourth verse. And this is a famous passage. It is called the Shema, which is from the first, first words, Hear, O Israel. Shema Yisrael. This was sort of a call to worship for the Jews down through the time of Jesus. And this is the part, this is the Old Testament scripture Jesus was quoting when they asked him what the most important commandment was. So, it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. This one passage of scripture has had a huge impact in terms of the, the ritual practice of the Jewish people. Because, for instance, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead is the verse from which the Jews developed the, pra the practice of the phylacteries. You know what a phylactery is? If you've ever seen pictures of, of uh, Jewish people, and those of you taking 
one of the other two classes, if you have the, the Yarbrough and, and uh, Elwell book, it has a picture in there, and they literally wrap a leather strap around their forearm, and there's a box on their forehead. That is called a phylactery, and it's on their, there's a scripture verse that is written, very tiny, that's on their arm, and it's on, in the box on their forehead. That's taken from this. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. So they literally do that, uh, the, the Orthodox Jews, when they are preparing to pray. And then write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You may have, if, if you've ever been in a, a Jewish home or entered a Jewish home, you may notice that there's a little, uh, a little box. Looks like frequently there. It looks like the two tablets of the Ten Commandments on the door frame as you walk in. <clears throat> that contains a scripture verse. That's considered a blessing on a house. And that comes from this, to take scripture and write it on the door frames of your house um, and on your gates. That's is called it, a mezuzah. Is it a particular scripture, or is it this one? Sometimes they will use this one. There are other scriptures. The point is, is it says the commandments. It's and so it will be one of the significant commandments. Sometimes, like on the mezuzahs, it looks like a Ten Commandments because they will write the Ten Commandments very tiny on a little piece of paper or, uh, and put it inside. It's like a little locket. Usually they're about that tall. And it will be fastened to the doorframe of a Jewish home. So this verse has meant a lot. But the point of this verse is the commandments of God, the word of God, what God has given us in his written revelation to us, is critically important that we should uh, impress them on our children, talk about them when we sit at home and when we walk along the road, when we lie down, when we get up. We are to immerse our lives with the communication God has given us through his written word. Now this was true for the Old Testament, uh, for the Jews of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, one of the five books of the law of Moses. The second, any questions about that? The second verse I want us to look at initially here is from the New Testament, and it is Paul's writing to Timothy in the second letter to Timothy. He writes in the third chapter, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, this part I quoted earlier, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here, Paul is saying exactly what I said earlier about, you know, it's Jesus that saves us, but it is the Bible, it is God's Word that leads us to the truth of Jesus so often. We may hear the testimony or the example in somebody's life of Jesus Christ, but it is Scripture that, that introduces us to Him. That's when he says, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Word of God, Paul is telling Timothy... You've been really good since you were a child. Timothy's mother uh, was apparently a, a Christian. She, um, his father was a, a Gentile. And I won't get into that. There's the story associated with that. But the, um, the fact that Timothy had grown up in a Christian home, that since he was a very young man, he had been taught the Old Testament scripture, had been introduced to Jesus, and had learned from the other writings that became scripture during the time of his life. And... Paul is saying, absolutely, don't forget the critical importance of the Holy Scripture in your life. Because that's the thing that brought you to wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ. And it is the thing that will teach you and give you the ability to rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness and equip all of God's people for good work. By the time Timothy would have received this from Paul, he was a pastor in the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a crossroads for so many things. I mean, Paul planted a church there. Um, the Apostle John, John the Beloved Apostle, and Jesus, the mother of Mary, moved to Ephesus and lived there. Um, Timothy, as I say, was a pastor there. There was a whole lot of activity associated with the city of Ephesus. If you've never been to Ephesus, it is the, it's considered the most significant archaeological site in the world today. And it's quite something. Um, you, maybe sometime I'll do that slideshow that people have asked me about more recent trip. So, so these two passages from Deuteronomy, and from Timothy, give us a clear understanding. And more than an understanding, they give us a mandate for why we should be reading and studying God's Word, the Bible. The first one in Deuteronomy, this is just one of the Old Testament passages in which God instructs His people, the people of Israel, and by extension, instructs us, 
because the word that was written to them has come down to us as part of our scripture as well, that we are to study God's word, the word that he has given us, Study the commandments that are in it, and in that way, immerse ourselves in what's God, what God's messages for us have been. We are instructed to study the Word of God. Here in Deuteronomy, we're told to have His words on our hearts, to teach them to our children, to discuss them at home, uh, uh, to talk about them when we travel, when we lie down, when we get up. In other words, to make them an absolutely uh, integral part of our lives. Is that true for you? Do you talk about scripture at home? Do you think about it when you lie down, when you get up, when you travel? Um, if you haven't, it's never too late to start. It's important that when we, uh, when we go to church, when we join in worshiping with other Christians, when we listen to the reading and preaching of God's word, we understand that the 25 minutes or so that we many of us spend on Sunday morning, that's not sufficient. That's not enough. So many people think that to be a Christian, okay, I attend church every every Sunday, and uh, about twice a month I make it to the Friday Bible study. And that must, that's probably enough. No, <laughs> according to this, you are to immerse yourself in it. It is to be an important part of your life. The Jewish people practice this in terms of the, the home rituals. You know, the Shabbat preparation at home that the whole family was involved in, the reading of scripture, the fact that, that, um, that boys prepared for their uh, Bar Mitzvah, which was the point in which they first read the Word of God publicly, and after that they were then equipped and prepared and accepted as being adults in the community who could participate in the religious services, most especially in the reading of God's Word. Um, and so all of the Jewish expectation was that your whole life is immersed with this. Not 25 minutes to hear a sermon on Sunday in you know, an hour Bible study every once in a while. It should be so much more a part of who we are and what we live. The second passage in Timothy in the New Testament is part of uh, the, the instruction that Paul gives his student, and more than student, he was almost like a son to Paul. He clearly had affection for Timothy um, as a, a disciple of his. Paul was his mentor, his guide, very much kind of a father figure. And in, in this, Paul tells Timothy to remember to put into practice all he's learned, to remember that Scripture is God-breathed. And I've talked before about the fact that 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 expression, it is God breathed here in, in verse 16, there is implied in that the presence of the Holy Spirit and the activity of the Holy Spirit. Because breath, or to be breathed, is pneuma in Greek, and the pneuma is the word for spirit as well. So God breathed has inherited this idea that it was by an act of the Holy Spirit that the scripture came to be. Um, and that it's to be the basis not only for teaching and training, but for our whole moral conduct in life, it's the way we are to direct leadership and ultimately prepare everyone who is in the church. And while you may not have a formal position of leadership in the church, you have a position of leadership in the church. We are the priesthood of believers. Okay? Every believer in Jesus Christ has a responsibility to act as a member. In fact, uh, there are four great tenets of the Reformed faith, if you're Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed or any of that. One of those is the priesthood of all believers. We all have responsibility to take a leadership role in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. So, Deuteronomy tells us we need to immerse every part of our lives in God's word and its meaning for us. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, the second letter, tells us scripture is clearly from God, and it should be the yardstick for us as to how we teach, grow, order our lives, and prepare ourselves to be the people of God. So we need to ask ourselves, with regard to scripture, are we doing that? It's the same question I asked him you know, from James this morning in our Bible study. Are we doing this? Are we immersing ourselves in God's Word, really? Are we constantly learning from Scripture and using it as a guide for our life? If we are not doing that, if our Christian walk is Sunday mornings and maybe Friday Bible study, then we are at best only half of a Christian. At best, we are only half of what God wants us to be. Because nothing, no other single thing is as important to our spiritual life and growth as God's word in our lives. Donald Whitney, the author of one of our two books, he's the author of the book Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, says this, but as for you, continue, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, reading Timothy again. No spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. He says intake, but again, I'm going to get into that. It's more than just reading. 
than the intake of God's Word. Nothing can substitute for it. There simply is no healthy Christian life apart from a diet of the milk and meat of Scripture. Regardless of how busy we become with all things Christian, we must remember that the most transforming practice available to us is the disciplined intake of Scripture. God gave us this book for a reason. He reveals himself and his will. And he also reveals us and tells us about ourselves in this book. Since we're talking about growing in a relationship with God, if we don't start with the things God has told us about himself historically, <clears throat> down through history, then how can we have a solid foundation? We must know the word of God in order, uh, in order to grow through the other spiritual disciplines toward God. And I think it's important for us to see, but we forget this the further away we get from our college years, but um, throughout the world, people will do almost anything. They'll try following cult leaders, reading the wildest and most obscure and sometimes downright crazy spiritual writings. They'll do almost anything to get even a hint of real truth. The mysteries of the Kabbalah, the Vedas and Upanishads of Hinduism, the Book of Mormon, the Gnostic Gospels, we talked about Gospel of Thomas a little bit in our mystic class. The more obscure and inaccessible and hard to find people seem to think, the better. Because maybe then they'll really find something that's true and meaningful and direct them in their lives as to what's important. They'll do anything for just a hint of truth. And the whole time, we in the Western world have the most important, powerful, and life-changing of all writings in all human history right here. And we miss it. Familiarity breeds contempt, or at least breeds uh, obscurity. We, we miss the fact that this is around anymore. We have so much access to God's Word that we take it for granted, and we don't even bother to read it. We don't pick it up. Even those of us who confess to be followers of Jesus, that's true. A study was done of American Christians. These are regular churchgoers. And they determined that only 18% of all people who claim to be church-attending Christians read any of the Bible in any given week. We have a problem. How are we going to be what God wants us to be when we are overlooking and not accessing God's revelation of himself in his own word? We don't even bother to read it. It's God's message to us. It is God's love letter to us. Um, and it's his instruction book for our human life. Right. No. Well, right. we so all I'm know this. Okay. And I speak for myself. I'm a, I'm a lazy Christian, I guess. <laughs> and just started to do um, like a discipline kind of thing. I know okay. I don't like the word discipline. Oh, I do. I like to be... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I think it's an obvious answer. I mean, it's, it's Satan is... Once he's lost... The war, he can win the different battles in our life, and one of those battles is us being uh, committed to daily prayer, um, seeking God's will, all that, you know, on a regular, disciplined right. basis. I mean, you mentioned 18 percent, and that's just picking it up sometime during the week. Yeah. I mean, and you get down to, how about people that read this? I mean, I've got a son-in-law, as long as I've known him, he gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning before everybody, and the first thing he does, he's quiet, and he's not like saying, looking at me, he's in the corner someplace, right. and, and I see that, and I think, you know, you need to judge yourself. I say, oh, gosh. Yeah, that's so, right. It's, um, I need to keep it. There's something that keeps us, like you said, um, there was a certain point where you weren't dedicated to that. It was there something that, and I'm not looking for a magic pill. Sure. Like you, to the stores, so getting one of those discipline pills. I mean, <laughs> was there something that, like, clicked? All well, just the final was, realization one day about, I'm not doing this right, yeah. and let me start, and I began to see the effect of it. and and. When I started, I'm going to talk about my own discipline a little bit later, just as an example, not as the ideal, but as right. an example. Um, when I started, it was hard. I didn't particularly enjoy it. Now, I, there's nothing that interrupts that. I mean, there are some days 
that I'm looking at, okay, I've got 16 hours worth of work before the 10 o'clock Bible study. Okay. And I still do my morning uh, time in scripture. Uh, you've got to do it. And I love it. I won't give it up partly because I've got to the place that I so much enjoy it. But I didn't start out that way. And so good for your son. Because it's, it's when you, you have to be willing to stick it out. You have to have some discipline in order to get there. And you're also right that even though the devil has lost the war, he wants to try to create as many casualties along the way, even if that just means he can try to keep us from having joy, from having all that God wants for us. And that's, even if we are saved, even if he can't take us out of the hands of Christ, he will want to make us uh, as miserable a Christian as he can along the way. In the morning when you're in the Word, are you studying the Word or are you just reading the Word? Let me talk about that. Uh, there's, there's two different processes. For me, and I'm going to give you some of my own uh, belief about this. Those of you who were in How to Study the Bible uh, last term, of course we had last term, which is available online, um, we talked about that, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I actually have two different kinds of Bibles that I use. Okay? So, <coughs> back to the point of no matter what people think today, no matter how much they think they've got to go to the obscure parts of the Himalayas to try to find some truth about the divine, God has not been silent. He has very clearly told us about himself and about us and what our problem is, what our brokenness is, and what he wants us to do about that, how he wants to relate to us. And it is found in this book. Okay? Now, um, as, as you said, Rod, we, some of you may say, well, we know all that. Well, I've got to hammer this in to make sure that we understand this is the foundation. And then we're going to talk very practically about what we do about it. But if God has told us everything we need to know, but we won't read it, God has, God has sent us a clear and detailed message of all the things that we really need to hear, but we won't even pick it up when it's right in front of us, then there is something that we need to change about our processes. It's not, you know, I had a friend of mine once say that, you know, like Ezekiel, if God would just send me a scroll, <laughs> I would even eat it. If God would send me a scroll, like Ezekiel did, and tell me what he wants me to do. And my response was, I think he has. Okay? Good. There's so much in there that we don't take advantage of. But if we're not willing to spend the time reading the message that God has sent, if we don't listen to God's voice in Scripture, how, as a foundational issue, how can we expect to really know anything else about God? We don't start there. We want, you know, we want to jump ahead. I want to know that in 10 minutes a day, I can say some, you know, write me a prayer that I can say that will give me all of the spiritual satisfaction I'm looking for. No, that's not the way it works. You've got to go through you know, primary school before you can reach graduate level kinds of spirituality. And that's simply a fact. We've got to be prepared to start with God's scripture for us. That's where we learn to understand what God expects of us. That's where we learn what it means to grow in Christ, is through that word. But so many of us who want God to be present in our life still are not willing to make that effort. Um, and I, I always remember the man, the story is told of the man who really, he prayed to God in faith and said, God, let me win the lottery. I will use the money for good, but please let me win the lottery. And he prayed, prayed, and prayed, and he didn't win, didn't win. He said, Lord, I don't know why you're not letting me win. I would do really good works with this money, so let me win the lottery. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and didn't win the lottery. And this went on forever. And finally, in frustration, the man throws up his hands and says, God, I've been praying to you for so long. Why won't you let me win the lottery? And God leans over to him and says, well, you could at least buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ticket. <clears throat> Reading this is, maybe I shouldn't have used such a big one, that's a little imposing. <laughs> but this is the ticket that God allows us to win the spiritual lottery with, okay? But we've got to be prepared to do our part. If you want to know what God thinks, if you want to know what God says, it's in there. It's in the Bible. If you want to grow in your love for God and your love for other people, if you want to grow as in Christian maturity, you have to make the effort of looking in His Word. You can't always expect for somebody else like the preachers and the teachers, to chew your food for you. That only works so far. You have to get into the Word yourself. You have to read God's Word for yourself. And if you will do that one thing, that one simple thing, it does require discipline, it does require setting aside of some time. But if you do just that one thing, I promise you, because the book promises you, 
you will grow in your relationship with God. You will grow in your maturity as a Christian. You will grow to be more Christ-like. And the more you grow in the Word, the more you will grow in those ways. I guarantee it, because I believe what that Word says to us. And it tells us that. So now let's talk about practical aspects. How you do that. Um, even though we're only quarter tail, I'm going to take a break, because this is a good place to break. Let's take a 10 minute break. We will start back at 5 minutes until 2 o'clock. Okay? Why the Bible, why Scripture, God's Word to us, is so critically important. Now I want to talk about um, some aspects of the intake of Scripture into our lives, and then in hopefully very practical sense for you, how you do it. Um, the four aspects, and I've got this highlighted because we'll start with the first one, are one, receiving God's Word, and we do that through hearing and through reading, two different things, two different senses that we use. Secondly, we'll talk about meditating on God's Word, which is the process of trying to figure out what is God saying to me in this. The third is studying God's Word, and those of you from our How to Study the Bible last term will recognize observation, interpretation, meditation, and application. We'll talk about that. And then finally, memorizing God's Word. No way we leave. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's talk first about receiving God's Word. Um, there are several passages that simply, scripture verses, that just talk about the importance of God's Word for us to receive it. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed rather are those who hear the Word of God and obey it. You'll notice that I listed under receiving, hearing, and reading. From Romans 10, 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Elsewhere, it, um, it, it says, how will they believe unless they hear, and how will they hear unless someone goes and tells them? 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. All three of these are talking about receiving God's word by hearing it. And I think that's critically important. Um, we think about reading God's word. But we don't always emphasize the significance of hearing God's Word. We need, as Christians, to make sure that we put ourselves in places as often as possible where we are hearing God's Word. We do that especially through church on Sunday morning. And it, 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 we are a church here at Lakeside Presbyterian. I believe very strongly that hearing God's Word just doesn't, doesn't just mean hearing me or somebody else preach. We use the lectionary every week, which not all Presbyterian churches do. Some do. The lectionary means that for the, the Revised Common Lectionary, for churches all over the world, literally, of different denominations, many of them have agreed on this lectionary, which means that over a three-year period, you hear pretty much all of Scripture. There is an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, a responsive reading, which is usually taken from the Psalms or Proverbs, sometimes from elsewhere, but almost always from Psalms or Proverbs, and then there is a gospel. And so in our church, every week, we have Old Testament reading, New Testament reading, um, the responsive reading from Psalms or Proverbs, and we have the gospel. In addition to whatever text the preacher is preaching from. Okay, Sometimes I will preach from one of the readings. During Advent, I chose the gospel reading in each case. Um, in fact, people who are not used to that come. Barbara, I mentioned you, you know, because you, you hadn't been in a church that had had lectionary readings before. And so she came up to me after being in a few services and said, I was trying to understand what that had to do with your sermon, and I didn't quite get it. Uh, and I said, you know, we believe in people hearing God's word, even if it doesn't directly relate to the sermon. Just the hearing of God's word, we believe, has impact. Now, the preaching of God's word where you take a text and you, you know, the preacher, the person who is called and anointed for that, uh, expounds on the meaning of it, that's part of it. But just hearing God's word spoken is also very, very important. Okay? So we, you know, we're a church that believes that, and I believe that's a solid thing for you to look for opportunities. Bible study, that also would include getting scripture CDs and playing them in your car when you're, you know, when you're stuck in traffic in the middle of I hee kind of character. Okay? <laughs> Which sometimes can be... You know, I could get through most of Isaiah on Sundays. <laughs> um, the opportunity to hear God's word when you're when you're working around the house or whatever, instead of putting on you know the Eagles or the radio. 
try listening to, and there's some wonderful things out there that are <coughs> the scripture being read. But as often as possible, we need to try to find opportunities to hear God's word read, expounded on in terms of preaching, um, and just to, to let it soak into our lives. One of the most important things, and I was going to mention this later, but I'll bring it up here because I think it's, it's, it's valuable. One of the most, uh, one of the important preliminary things, one of the first things that you can do if you have not had a lot of experience with God's Word, is to develop a general just familiarity with it. To have a basic familiarity with what's in Scripture, what it's all about, because that then gives you kind of a context for having a greater understanding. And some of that is just hearing it. You know, if you listen to the prophet Isaiah, you can get a sense of the, the tone and context and direction, even if you were not doing a really intensive study at that time. And it's very valuable to do. So one of the things that we need to do is simply hear God's word. Read, <coughs> preached on, spoken as often as we can. Because it then begins to absorb into our lives. Now by itself, that's not enough. Even the going to church and hearing it read and preached on is not enough. We need to do more than that. But that's a starting place. Okay. I think beyond that, we then talk about, um, beyond hearing it, we talk about reading it. The most important first step, I believe, as we begin to read God's Word, is to make a commitment to do it every day. You need to be reading Scripture every day. The reason is very simple. You don't eat food once a week or once a month, because if you did, you would starve, or at least you'd be miserable. If you choose only to consume God's Word once a week or once a month, then you're spiritually going to be starving, or you're at least going to be miserable. We, our spirit needs to be consuming the Word of God on a daily basis, just like our body needs to be consuming food on a daily basis. And it's not, you don't have to do that much for it to make a fundamental significant change in your life. If you will spend 15 minutes a day, then you should, if you're an average reader, be able to read the entire Bible in a year. Just 15 minutes a day. Okay. Um, that's not that much. But you have to make a commitment to it. And part of making a commitment to it is you need to find a specific time <laughs> and a specific place Right? You're talking about your son. Every morning, 6 o'clock, he gets up, he has a place, right? For me, and if you were in the How to Study the Bible class last term, you heard me talk about this, my pattern is very simple. I get up usually at 5.30, sometimes earlier than that, because I'm a morning person. Okay? Um, I, I, I get up, I go downstairs, I give my dogs a treat, <laughs> I make a cup of coffee, Espresso, really good coffee. I'm from Seattle. Uh, and then I go in, and I have one place that I sit, and my Bible is right there. And I pick it up, and I read. My, you know, the ribbon is where I finished last time. I start reading, and I read until I've read enough. It's not 15 minutes. It's not three chapters. Now, for some people, that may be what you need to do. You need to say if, uh, that I'm going to read a certain number of chapters a day, especially when you're first getting started. For me, I just start reading, and when I've read enough, the Spirit says to me, that's enough for today. And for me, I start Genesis 1-1, and I read through the end of Revelation. And when I'm done, I go back to Genesis 1-1, and I start reading it again. I'm not in a hurry. There's, this is not a race. I don't get extra points for getting it all done in a month, or six months, or a year. I read it until the Spirit says, that's enough for today. The only thing I do other than that, this particular, is that when I read, um, I always make sure that I stop on the first chapter so, you know so that I know where to start again. Like on this ribbon, there's no chapter start except seven, right? And if there were two, like if six was over here, then I would know it was six because it's the first one on this two-page spread. That's where I stopped. So simple as that. That's about the only rule I have. So 5.30, give the dogs their treat. Get a cup of coffee, sit down, same place, pick this up, read it from wherever I am now until that's enough. Now, you may need to be something a little more specific than that. I recommended this to some people last term, and I talked about this in church too. And some people started doing that, and they started with Genesis 1-1, and they were fine with Genesis, and they were fine with Exodus, <laughs> and then they got a little bit of us. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there's some wonderful sections, and there's some sections that are not, you know, that are harder. 
That's the reason that in Whitney's book, he recommends that, that, that if you have difficulty with that, you don't just you know, start and go all the way through. He recommends, his suggestion is you start in five different places in the Bible, and that you read a little from each of those five places every day. Uh, he suggests start at Genesis, at Joshua, at Job, Isaiah, and Matthew. And that way, even if you're in Leviticus and you're bogging down, you're going to be reading something from somewhere else that's going to be a little more interesting. You're not going to completely, you know, your joints aren't going to freeze up because you're in the middle of Leviticus. Um, he also says another alternative would be to take three places, Genesis, Job, and Matthew. And the reason he picks those places, either three or five, is that that's dividing the Bible up fairly evenly. If you start in Matthew 1, or I'm sorry, if you start in Genesis 1, Joshua 1, Job 1, Isaiah 1, and Matthew 1, and you read forward from each of those places, you're going to finish those five sections at about the same time. Or if you start in Matthew or in Genesis, Job, and Matthew, same thing, because the Old Testament's about twice as long. Okay. So there are different ways you can do it. You also can get a reading plan that will guide you through it. And there's several ways you can do that. Um, the Tyndale Publishing House has a one-year Bible, which is very popular. And it will take you through the whole Bible, and it's broken up so that you have a daily reading every day. Take you through the whole Bible in 365 days. Leap year, you get a day off. <laughs> um, but you also, the simplest way to get a reading plan is to go online. Mm -hmm. If you go to BibleGateway.com, I mean, there are others you can do too. You can do a search for Bible reading plans. Well, BibleGateway.com has got a half a dozen different ones. In fact, they've got one that you start in the Old Testament on January 1 and read through the whole Bible. Um, they have a chronological version where you read, it, it breaks the scripture up into when the events happened chronologically, not when they were written chronologically, but when they, were, when they happened chronologically. They've got one that's historical, which means it takes it when the books were written. For instance, you get into the New Testament, it doesn't start with Matthew, it starts with, I'm not sure if it's James or Galatians, one of those two is the first book. Um, then they have special reading plans for Lent for 40 days and things like that. So there are reading plans available in scripture. You need to know what you're going to do before you sit down at whatever time you pick. You don't have to get up at 5.30. If, if that's not a good time for you, if you're one of the people that you really are comatose until about 7, then don't try to start reading the Bible at 5.30. It's important. Do it at a time when it's best for you. It may be 10 o'clock when you sit down for your cup of tea every morning, or it may be over lunch, or it may be early evening. Whenever is best for you, when your mind is most alert, when you're more focused, there is nothing more sanctified or holy about doing it at 5.30 in the morning than doing it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As long as you set the time and you keep it, it becomes a priority for you. Don't just sort of try to catch time sometime during the day, because the pressures of the world will keep you from doing this. You need a time that you have identified every day, you need a place that you do it, and you need a plan for um, how are you going to proceed? You don't want to sit down every day and go, oh, well, what am I going to read today? Well, let me read Psalm 1 again for the fourth time this week, because I like that one. Okay? No, you need to have a plan that will take you through all of Scripture. Okay? So there are very practical ways you can do that. Questions about that? Judy? Uh, we have our devotional load here that gives you a, a year. Yeah. It has dates in it if they don't want to go on computer. Well, it's true. It gives you, uh, now does it have a whole reading plan or is it just the daily readings? No, it's, it's, a, it's a yearly. Okay, it has a yearly plan as well. Okay. Uh, I should mention devotionals like our daily bread, which we provide here, and you're welcome to take one if you'd like, are fine, but there tends to be more an emphasis on what somebody else thought about it than there is on reading the scripture. Okay. I have no problem with, with reading scholars or having commentaries, all sorts of things. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But for your daily reading plan, your, I mean your daily reading, I would rather concentrate more on reading and hearing God's word than on reading what somebody else said about it. Now, if you do both, if you have a reading plan and you then take five minutes and you read a devotional like, like uh, David Bread, that's fine. There's no problem with that. But some people, you know, they'll get a, a little devotional and it'll have one verse and then they'll have, you know, a paragraph like this of somebody commenting on it. Well, you're getting more of somebody else's idea than you are. And those ideas can be wonderful. I mean, there's great devotionals out there. The other thing you can do, too, if you go on BibleGateway.com and there are others, you can get an email every morning, and you can tell them when you want to receive this. An email with the reading for the day. 
and it, you can include devotionals. I think it was, was it last week? We mentioned the fact Carolyn had given me a quote from Spurgeon um, in one of these classes. And uh, she gets those every day. You know, she, gets, she has a Bible reading plan that she has, and then she also gets these devotional notes. So there are lots of options that you can do, but you need to decide what is my plan and not try to invent one every time you sit down. Okay? Now, um, I'll talk about the two different kinds of Bibles in a minute. When you sit down to start, the first thing you need to do before you even open your Bible is you need to pray. Duh. You need to ask God very simply, not, not in a great flowery flowing kind of prayer, but you need to ask God to open the truth of his word to you, to open your heart to that truth, and to teach you what it is that he wants you to know for that day. Jesus in Matthew 7 said, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, those who seek find, and those who knock the door will be opened. So ask, Lord, show me your will in this. Teach me from your word. I am here to learn. I am here to grow. Help me with that through your Holy Spirit. That's all you have to say. But make sure you don't miss that part. Because the danger is that you begin to feel like this is entirely your effort rather than you opening yourself through the discipline of sitting down with God's Word to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about His truth. The point is not for you to spend 15 minutes a day. The point is to hear God's Word, or to hear God's voice every day through His Word. That's what you're looking for. And the book of James says, If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Show me the wisdom in your word, Lord. Um, now, when you start by asking God to help you in your efforts to read Bible, to help you apply it to your life, I would recommend you then, when you, when you get ready to open Scripture, is that you have a good modern translation. Now, I say modern translation, the King James is beautiful. It is beautiful language. But, unless you really are experienced with the King James, it's difficult for an early 21st century person to read the King James and get everything out of it. It's also, from a very practical point of view, not the best translation. A lot of the most significant um, and informative texts that were available, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, have been discovered since the King James. And so I think there's some verses that we have greater clarity about now than we did then. Not, there's no fundamental issue of our faith. None of those later findings, archaeological findings of text, changed any fundamental of our faith. But they did give us a little, a, a little clearer language on some of that stuff. And so I recommend you have a good modern translation. Um, the, I use the NIV, the International Version. That's the one we have as a, as a, a chair Bible. We don't have pews here, so we have a few Bibles. A chair Bible here. Um, and you might look around. New American Standard was the one I used before this. The Revised Standard Version, or the New Revised Standard Version, is good. Another one that's fairly much more recent and is good is, is the HCSB. I always think of HSCB, you know, the um, The HCSB, which is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This one's a study Bible. Um, very good translation. There, you know, there's the New English. Uh, there are a lot of very good translations out there, and, the point, and they're, they're, I believe, equally reliable. I won't go into that. We did in our, our class on um, last term on the Old Testament Bible and how to read the Bible. Um, the veracity of them, I think all of them are good. You have to find one you're comfortable with. Now, I recommend you have two Bibles because I believe that just reading the Bible is in itself, just like hearing the Bible in itself, has value. We begin to get immersed in the language of God's uh, scripture, and we begin to have a sense of context. This is my morning reading Bible. It's the NIV. It has no footnotes, the only, or study aids in the back. It's got like six maps or something. The only thing it has is the cross-reference uh, notes in the middle uh, column, which I don't usually use. Because when I sit down in the morning, I want to read, stuff, read God's Word and meditate on it, we'll talk about it in a minute, without saying, oh, I wonder what that word means. Oh, I wonder what that ceremony was all about. You know, looking at the footnotes kind of thing. That, that means looking at footnotes. Um, when I do my Bible study, which for me, I, I, I spend plenty of time in Bible study in preparation for Bible studies and for, you know, sermons and stuff. You need to do Bible study. If it's for that kind of reason, great. 
This is my study Bible. This is an NIV study Bible. This is exactly the same text as this. But the difference is, this has got footnotes out the gazoo, you know, and maps and charts and topical aids and, you know, a topical guide and dictionary and all kinds of stuff, which is wonderful. In fact, in our How to Study the Bible course, I require people to buy this if they're taking it for credit. Because this, this is, I believe, the best one-volume Bible library that you can get. It's got the, the most extensive topical um, concordance, I mean, regular concordance and topical uh, guide and all that. So when I'm studying for content, especially for me, if I'm teaching or preaching or whatever, this is the Bible I use. In the morning when I'm just reading God's Word, it's this. Now, I've heard some very good things written about, people, about thinking about your, your study life in Scripture as having dailies, and weeklies. That every day you sit down and read God's Word. 15 minutes, according to a guide, you have whatever. All right. For me, it's how long. You know, that's enough. That's to, that's a good thing. But then you also have at least one time a week. Maybe it's Sunday afternoon. Maybe it's Sunday morning before church. Maybe it's one night a week that you set aside where you spend an hour or two or more studying a passage of Scripture which means using the resources in here, and maybe resources online, and maybe books that you have, uh, if you have other kinds of uh, commentaries and things of that sort, where you, and there's several ways you can do that. You can do inductive Bible study, where you're focusing mostly just on what the Word has to tell you, and, but you go through studying that. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, or you can do topical Bible studies and various kinds of things. But I recommend two different Bibles, probably the same translation, so that you don't end up trying to worry about why does this one call it that and this one says that. I told the story about my friend Richard Sears, a college professor friend of mine who was teaching Bible study, he would teach Bible studies for us on campus. And Richard always said, well, if you have your Bibles with you, please close them and put them away. And he said, and the reason I'm saying that is, I don't want you to spend the next 20 minutes not listening to our study, but rather trying to worry about why yours says it this way, and that's not the way that I read it. So pay attention to what's being read here. And there's some validity to that. So I make sure I have the same translation for my reading Bible and my study Bible. Um, it's also true, and some, a lot of the stuff we talked about in the House Study of the Bible class, Studies have shown that it takes 21 days for you to create a regular habit in your life. So for the first 20 days, if you've decided I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to study the Bible or 3 o'clock, whenever it is, for 20 days, it's going to feel wrong to you. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel like, I'd almost rather be doing anything. You know? I uh, wonder what the kids are doing. I, maybe I'll call them, you know, or whatever. It's going to take you three solid weeks to get to the point that this becomes a regular pattern for you. When you first start, it is going to feel awkward. The devil doesn't want this to feel good. He doesn't want you to feel comfortable with this. And so, continue with it, and over time, it will not only become a natural habit, but you will also begin to sense, experience the wonders of this as something that's really joyful. And, and God the Holy Spirit will make it a pleasure for you. I believe that firmly because I've experienced it myself. When you do sit down to read the Bible every day, don't stress about it. I, you, it's, it's enough, especially when you're first starting, just to make yourself do it. But the main thing if you're for your regular reading kind of time is simply to let the words pour into you. I'm going to talk about meditation in just a second because you, you, you want to do some meditation during that reading time as well. But as I said earlier, I think that Bible study needs to start with a basic familiarity of what's in the Bible. That's not an intensive kind of study thing so much as it is exposing yourself to what's in Scripture and experiencing it. Um, just read, let it sink in. When you come to passages that um, are especially meaningful or that strike you, stop for a few minutes, um, spend some time on them. I'll talk about meditation in a second. I, as I say, start with Genesis 1, go through to Revelation, then start all over again. I don't know how many times I've done that. And, and, I, and I don't care. I haven't keep, kept track because I, I'm not going to brag about it. That's not the point. I have had somebody tell me in the past, I've read through the Bible 17 times from, from cover to cover. And I didn't say it, but my thought was, well, did it help? You know, did it make a difference? Because the point isn't how many times you get through it or how fast you get through it. 
Uh, it is, are you letting God's word seep, uh, seep into you? Now, um, we don't want to go for this. Okay, if, um, let me talk for a second about meditation, because I've mentioned it several times. Meditation, in a Christian sense, is not the same as Eastern meditation. There's a fundamental difference here. Um, Eastern meditation, which is transcendental meditation, it is relaxation therapy or New Age meditation, it's some kinds of yoga meditation. Um, the goal is to empty your mind. Some meditations, uh, like transcendental meditation, they sometimes will say things like, focus on, in your mind's eye, a black dot on a white sheet of paper. There's, the point is to make your mind as empty as you can, to not have a focus any more than you have to. And if you wander off, come back to sort of this kind of emptiness. The goal of Christian meditation is fundamentally different than that, because the goal of Christian meditation is not to empty the mind, but to fill the mind with a particular thing. And that is with the presence of God. Um, there, I, I will say also, with regard to meditation, Eastern meditation, the, the emptying of the mind, is spiritually can be really dangerous. And I'm not, I'm not speaking out against, for instance, all yoga. Yoga as an exercise discipline can be really wonderful, so don't misunderstand me about that. But there are some kinds of yoga that are really focused on the spiritual aspects of meditation as much as the, as the physical discipline, and they're pro they can be problematic. Now, the danger with Eastern meditation styles, that is, emptying the mind, is sort of reflected in Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. Jesus is talking about a demon that gets driven out. And it says, when the impure spirit, Jesus said, when the impure spirit comes out of a person and goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it, then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, that is, a person, uh, when the, the demon arrives back to the person, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. The idea being trying to empty yourself makes you a target to spiritual forces. Christian meditation is not an effort to empty yourself. It's an effort to center yourself on a focus that is God and his will for you and his word for you. Um, Christian meditation, I'm quoting Donald Whitney here, can be defined as deep thinking on the truths and spiritual values revealed in Scripture for the purpose of understanding, application, and prayer. Now again, here we're talking about um, meditation on Scripture particularly. There is a kind of meditation which is a listening prayer kind of thing. We'll talk about that under prayer more. Richard Foster says, Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. That one begins to get more into the listening and prayer aspect of meditation. Um, I would offer that Christian meditation is to focus our minds on God and on the things of God, especially as found in Scripture, and to answer the question, what is God saying to me? A passage of Scripture, when you pray, when you start to read Scripture, to say, Lord, teach me, open my mind and heart to you and to your wisdom, and in particular, show me what message you have for me. Show me what it is that you want to say to me today. And then as you read through the scripture and you come to a passage that really strikes you, jumps out at you, sort of pulls you up short, spend some time with that. Read through it several times. Think about what it says. Mentally sort of chew on it. Um, and then think about what it means. I recently, um, I, uh, I felt very angry at someone driving in the car. You guys have heard me say before when driving. And I was, I was feeling convicted about that. And I come to a passage in the Gospels that say that it is out of a person's heart that the words flow. And it's what in your, what's in your heart that gets reflected in the things that you say. I mean, I'd say anything awful, but I was upset about something, you know, and I expressed it within the confines of my own vehicle. Um, and I, I was struck by that because it's something I had been feeling convicted about. And I thought about that, and I thought about it. And I was, what does that mean about my heart? Lord, you know, where is my heart, and what do you want me to do about that? And I'm giving you this as an example. I spent a long time thinking about that. And then, I 
believe the Spirit said to me after, after quite a while of me spending thinking, chewing on, reading over, thinking about what it means, that it is from my heart that things come out of my mouth. And when those things are, are not good things, what does that say about my heart? I remember, created me a clean heart, O Lord. And I think the Lord was saying to me, if there, is, if there is darkness in your heart that's being expressed, and you've recognized the fact that you need a clean heart, I'm going to give you one, if you'll ask. And you may need to keep asking. And so, since that time, when I start feeling angry or, you know, expressing something, you, you must think I really, I yell at Carolyn and everything else. I don't, you know, but particularly in the car. That's the, um, then those are the times when I now am reminded, my prayer is created me a clean heart, oh Lord. My frustration and my, ah, why don't you move over if you're going to be this? That's not the reflection of a heart that is so and peaceful before the Lord. That is not a clean heart. So, Lord, my prayer becomes, created me a clean heart. That's an example for me of having meditated upon scripture that I came across and how the Lord sort of worked me through that. And it became an important thing for me in the last few weeks. Make sense? You understand? Pardon? The second half, I renew the right spirit within me. And renew a right spirit within me. Daily, right? daily prayer, filth of Evil comes to you every day. It's not you can do this once a year. It's okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be praying that prayer a lot. You know, create a clean and be a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Um, but that's what meditation is. It is not just to read the scripture, but to to ask God to have things stand out to you. To take time with those things. To think about them. To pray about them. To let them sink in. Um, and I kept coming back to that scripture and really chewing on it thinking, Lord, there's something here. Bring me to a better understanding of what you're trying to say to me. Next. What are you saying to me, Rich? You, you talk about chewing on the word. I don't know if this is true or not, but in relationship to a cow, a cow. it has many stomachs, and it keeps bringing the food back up, and it's chewing on it again and getting every nourishment that they can out right. of that particular thing, and it keeps doing it over and over. Yeah, that analogy is used in scriptures. I didn't want to use it because it's really gross. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely accurate. You know, a, a cow chews its cud. I mean, you see the cow doing this thing, right? Well, they swallow, and then they regurgitate it, and they chew on it a while longer, and then they swallow, and then it comes back up, and they chew on it a while longer, as gross as that may sound. It's probably a pretty accurate sense of what meditating on God's word will be if it's if God is trying to speak to you about that. Okay? Um, it's also true that as we meditate, there's a sense in which meditation, and Whitney talks about this, spiritually warms us. I think it was Whitney, it may have been Foster. Uh, that it sort of stokes our spiritual fires. And that's scriptural. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, is not my word like fire declares the Lord. And then King David in Psalm 39.3 says, when I meditated, the fires burned. This idea of us being warmed by this sense of not just skipping over, you know, it's, it's not like a stone on a pond where we're just sort of skipping across God's Word. You know, when I talk about sitting and just reading and letting it pour over you, it's with the understanding that we're also asking God to bring certain things to light as we go through that, and that's the meditation. Uh, they quote Puritan Pastor Thomas Watson as saying, the reason that we come away so cold from reading the Word is because we do not warm, warm ourselves at the fire of meditation. We do not warm ourselves at the fire of meditation. So if you're feeling cold, reading the Scripture, and I'm like, it's not meaning anything, ask God to bring something up that you can chew on, that you can work with, that can mean something to you, that you can meditate on. Okay? Questions about meditation? Psalm 1, 1 to 3, to sort of tie this up in a nice bow. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, or scornful, it says in the King James. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he, what? Meditate. Meditate. Meditates day and night. <clears throat> to chew on, to work on. To seek understanding of, to, to ask God, what are you saying to me in this? He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. 
meditation, growing and understanding by chewing and spending time with the Word of God. And then I want to talk about studying God's Word. Uh, as I said, you might think in terms of dailies where you read God's Word and meditate on it and ask God to show you particular things. But then there also is the, is the process of studying God's Word, which is for the purpose of gaining a greater understanding. Whereas the reading and meditating, it, it's, a, it's a cognitive thing too, but it really is more of a heart thing. It's almost a more prayerful thing. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. Studying Scripture is partly so that we cognitively can gain more understanding. So that you will understand, have more answers for, have more explanations for, the questions that come up in life based upon your study of Scripture. And the books that we used last term in our How to Study the Bible course were inductive, the inductive Bible study part was K. Arthur's uh, Precepts Ministries. You may be familiar with it. Precepts Ministries is a, is a well-known ministry organization. K. Arthur, K. Arthur has written a number of books. The one we use is called The New How to Study the Bible. And it deals with inductive Bible study, where you're letting the Bible itself speak to you and in particular, it, there are, K. Arthur talks about three steps. I think there are four. I think there's one they sort of leave out. She mentions observation, interpretation, and application as part of um, inductive Bible study. <coughs> inductive means you go to the scripture and let it speak rather than you know, trying to let somebody else tell you what it means, the commentary kind of thing. There's nothing against commentaries, but don't start there. Go to the Word of God itself. I add meditation. To me, observation is, what does it say? Interpretation is, what does it mean? Meditation is, what does it mean to me? What is God saying to me about this? And application is, how do I apply this to my life? How should this change me? You got that? Observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Meditation, what does it mean for me? And application, how should this change my life? Now, if you're interested in that, I'm not going to go into a lot more detail about those things. You can go online to our liteachapala.org website, and all of the lectures are on there. We had a couple of weeks where we did uh, actual practicum. We had people gathered around the tables doing inductive Bible study or topical Bible study. So those aren't on there, but the general lecture materials are. Um, the other book that we used is Rick Warren's book called Bible Study Methods, which includes, how many was it? 12, 12. 12, 12 different kinds of Bible studies, uh, including topical is one we focus on, which is really good. If, you, um, if you've got an issue in your life, uh, maybe it's, it's a relationship with a family member, or uh, maybe it's pride, or worry. Let's say worry. If worry... If you find yourself worrying about things and you want to know what the Word of God says about that, a topical Bible study would be to take that particular topic and go in and find everywhere in Scripture whether, where it talks about that, either specifically by using that word or you know, topically generally addressing it. <coughs> and you can get a topical study Bible, which is a, a concordance is a book that lists the words in the Bible. So you can look, up it, look things up by word. And you have to make sure that it matches the translation you have, because there's a different concordance for the King James versus for the NIV versus whatever. Because if you look up a word in a concordance that doesn't match, it's, you're not going to find, you know, it's not going to match up with what you've got. But then a topical um, dictionary lists topics. For instance, you can look up the topic Trinity. Trinity, the word does not occur anywhere in the Bible. You can't look up Trinity in the concordance, but you can look it up in a topical Bible. Um, Trinity is a concept that is very clear, I believe, in Scripture, but they never use that word. And one of the reasons that I like the NIV Study Bible is it has the most comprehensive concordance. And, okay, this is the concordance. This is the topical study Bible. You know, like 20,000 different topics that they address in the topical study Bible. The most that they have in any study Bible. Or you can get a whole volume, or you can go online and look up topical study Bibles or concordances. And look at, and if worry is a problem in your life, you can do a topical study of worry and see what scripture teaches you about that or whatever other issue it might be. Okay? Um, Jerry Bridges is quoted in, um, I think it's Whitney, 
is saying reading gives you breadth. Remember I said one of the purposes of just your daily reading is to get a broad sense of what scripture is, to have a broad familiarity with it. So Bridges says reading gives you uh, breadth, study gives you depth. Study is the process of, of, of gaining all the understanding you can from a particular passage of Scripture or a topic in Scripture or whatever. So it's to dig deeper on a more limited basis. And you should be doing that as well. A couple of, uh, several verses. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. To me, that means we hear God's word and we study to apply it. Um, to, to live by it. 2 Timothy 2 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Suggested in that idea of dividing the word of truth is that you get into it and study it to try to seek a more in-depth understanding of it. And Romans 12, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I said a minute ago that whereas just reading and meditating is almost more of a heart thing. Yes, there's a cognitive as aspect, but your, your heart is being touched. Study, getting depth of understanding, is the transforming that happens when you renew your mind. Because it, it is more your mind being involved when you study. And that's critically important. That way we know the will of God, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay? Questions about that? I didn't spend a lot of time on studying because you can get 12 hours worth of lectures on video if you want to go to litchapala.org. And I would just be repeating some of that material if quite a few of you were in that class. In fact, is there, for those who were in that class, is there anything very particular that jumps out in your mind that I didn't mention that we maybe got to last term? Any comments? Anyone? Okay, you all can go there uh, to, to the site if you wish. And also the materials that are found here in terms of study. The last part I want to talk about is memorizing God's Word. Oh, groan. <laughs> yeah. Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Ever find yourself in a real situation where you've got to make a decision right now and there's no time to go look it up in your top of the study Bible? What's your basis for knowing how to act? Some of it obviously is your relationship with God and the fact that the Spirit will guide you, but much of it is knowing and having remembered, even memorized, what is in God's Scripture to guide you in your life. Proverbs 22, pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise, apply your heart to what I teach. For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips. Keep them in your heart, have them ready on your lips. So that your trust may be in the Lord, I teach you today, even you. And Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, and take to heart what is written. I think that more, means more than just take it seriously. It literally means to take it into yourself. Because the time is near. <clears throat> now, in the other class, um, I talked about <coughs> memorization. And people who say they can't remember, oh, I can't remember anything. I'm too old for that. <laughs> I never been really able to remember anything. What's your phone number? Somebody may not know your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> What's your address? Okay, you got it written down. Um, the, the Jews, the ancient Jews, and other ancient, ancient Middle Eastern people, um, for a long time, even after they could write, they didn't write things down because oral tradition was considered more important, more valuable. Um, again, I mentioned in the other class, young men even today in uh, Islamic countries are expected to memorize the whole Quran, which is about the same length as our New Testament. They memorize it all. And they go, well, yeah, those are young men. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, which class was it I talked about this in? I don't even remember. About the Bedouins and all this? Um, it was Mondays. Monday. So it was the New Testament survey. Okay, so yeah, it was New Testament survey. The, the Bedouins of the uh, desert, of the deserts of the Middle East, they're the nomads who travel in the desert. There were Westerners who went there late in the 18th century, late 1700s, and they recorded the, uh, by writing, 
course, the stories and the poems of the, of the Bedouins, especially the ones that they taught to their children that were part of the rites of passage that were, that were considered important to be an adult. Well, late 20th century, 300 years later, people took that original record and went back to the Bedouin peoples and asked them to share the poems and the stories that were involved in the, the, the rites of passage to manhood. And they were exactly the same as 300 years earlier. The point I was making on Monday is that the claim that oral tradition, which occurred before the Gospels were written and before Paul's writing, etc., before the story of Jesus was written down, some liberal scholars will say, well, oral tradition, they lost the stuff and they forgot it and they added to it and they changed it and everything else. No, they didn't. Oral tradition was considered critically important even up to and past the time of Jesus. A wonderful story that I had read uh, in a different text was in the 1970s, an American professor of chemistry was teaching in Beirut, Lebanon. And he gave a test to his students. And one of the students, he accused him of cheating because he quoted verbatim a large section of the textbook on the test. And he said, you, you cheated. And the student said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, you can't, how do you explain that? He said, well, I memorized the book. Yeah. And the American professor didn't believe him, so he took him to the dean and accused him of cheating. And the dean pulled out the text and opened it and said, recite for me page whatever, 212. And the student recited the page. He had memorized the whole book. That's, that was part of that culture. And you say, well, that was that culture, and those were young people, etc. Okay? Finish this for me. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, off with all of you. <laughs> I can't afford a carriage, but you will look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. 1892. <laughs> That's when that was written. Okay? Some of you younger folks are going, well, I, I saw that Sierra. <laughs> For you, yesterday. <laughs> now it's good to be on their Okay, all right. Um, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. <laughs> you can't remember things? I could go on all day giving you the first part of commercials. That was the Coke commercial from 1971. <laughs> That's a Coca-Cola commercial. We get brainwashed. You do remember things, whether you think you do or not. Repeat it over and over and over. Yeah. Maybe it's by repeating it over and over. Maybe you have to work a little harder. But is it worth it if it's God's word? More so than the commercials. Absolutely. More so than the commercials. Turn off the TV and work on God's Word a little bit, okay? Uh, yes? I yeah. think music really helps. I remember when I started learning, I had someone gave me a Psalter. Okay. Which I forget which uh, religious affiliation has the, they only, they only sing scripture. Right. And a Psalter is the psalm set to music, which is how they originally were. Yes. Wow. Anyways, it was a beautiful way for, I found myself I memorizing scripture with the music. Yep. Yeah. Brought it together. Well, and it, it is, and you can... You know, one of the things that you can do is listen to Christian music, particularly music that is based on scripture, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of music is. Uh, that's helpful as well. But my point in this is that, yes, memorizing may seem like a hard thing for you, but you can do it. And it is important to do it. I'm not saying memorize the whole New Testament, but if you can, great. But there are certain passages of scripture which are so fundamental to what we believe and stand for, that you need to have them in here and in here, not just in the book you carry around. Okay? Whitney does a good job, I think, of identifying the importance of memorizing certain scripture, that it supplies spiritual power for us in times of need. Do you remember how Jesus responded when he was in the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan with three temptations? How did he respond? Not specifically, but generally. He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture. He quoted the Old Testament, which was the scripture in that day, as an opposition to the temptations of the devil. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, for instance. And the devils too were. He was throwing scriptures, but he was with a twist. Misquoting. <laughs> yeah, the devil is, is misquoting scripture. Oh, but Jesus, his response to the difficulties the devil was giving was to quote scripture to him. So it supplies spiritual power. It strengthens our own faith. 
partic particular, you know, if you identify the scriptures that are important to learn, and you can strengthen your faith by being able to remember when you're driving, when you're standing in line at Bonkelmer, wherever you are, to be able to rehearse some of these things can strengthen your own faith. It can assist you in witnessing and counseling other people. So that you are able to give them an understanding of what you believe and what you have learned. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. King James says, for the hope that is in you. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know what? I can tell them what I think. Well, who are you? There's a great passage where, you know, in the, in, uh, the Gospels, where somebody is trying to perform miracles in Jesus' name, and the demon says... Jesus I know, and Paul I'm familiar with, but who are you? <laughs> well, if I can quote the Word of God to people and give them an explanation, here is what my hope is based on. If somebody says, well, I just, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think that I do enough good things to be able to, you know, to be saved and be admitted into heaven. For me to be able to say, Ephesians 2, it is by grace you are saved through faith. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not how good you are. It's not the good that you've done. It's God's grace, which means His free mercy. The gift. It's a free gift of God. Okay, if I didn't know that scripture verse, I could stumble around for an hour trying to figure out how to explain to somebody in unsatisfactory ways why them doing good things is not what is going to get them into heaven. So it helps you in your witnessing and counseling. It also is a means to God's guidance. Again, to be able to, to remember scripture verses, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit brings those things. If we discipline ourselves to learn, he brings them to our mind at times we need them for our own sense of God's guidance. And it stimulates our meditation to remember a passage and to be able to you know, continue to chew on it, even when you're not sitting with your Bible in front of you. So several keys to being able to start doing this which is in order. <laughs> Write out, first identify the, the, the scripture verses that you want to learn. Now you can do it by topic, you can pick a chapter, you can uh, do a prepackaged memory plan. It's the prepackaged memory plans, which you can get, there's a, the, the uh, navigators do a topical memory uh, verse um, plan. You can get them online, you can take the verses from a reading plan and memorize them. Um, I'm actually thinking of maybe when I next time I'm in the States, which will be in a couple of weeks, I may see if I can get some short, you know, here are the ten verses that you really ought to memorize and bring them back for you, okay? Um, I would have done that earlier, but I hadn't thought of it until I was getting ready for this class. So, identify the scripture verses you're going to focus on. Then write them down. Writing them out is helpful because it sort of anchors it. We talked before in another class about the fact that, that the things you see, you learn in a certain way. The things you hear, you learn in a different way. This is the reason I put stuff up here and not just read them. Because when it's both your eyes and your ears that are taking, and that's why I read them to you, then it anchors them more. When you write them, it affects a different part of the brain, and you, you, know, you get locked in more. So the more senses you use, the more you interact with things, the more you remember them. So write them down, work with them, put them on cards, you know, so that you can memorize them and test yourself. Ideally, work together with somebody else, a spouse or a friend, for accountability. You know, test each other on them. See, if, you know, flashcards. That's how you learn language words. That's how you learn so many things. Do the same thing with God's scripture verses. Make it a hobby, even a game, if necessary, in order to get to the place where you've memorized it. Finally, you need to make it a priority. All of this stuff. Reading God's word, meditating on God's word, studying God's word, and memorizing God's word. You need to make them priorities or they will never happen. A last point I want to make, or next to the last point I want to make, is do not think any of this will happen immediately. It's not going to be all set and working for you in a week from now. It takes time. You have to be patient. I said 21 days to create a habit. And this is a really important habit. Even once you get the habit, it's not going to have seeped into your spirit and really changed you in a positive way that it can. 
maybe for years. But it will be a process that you will benefit from. Eugene Peterson said this. You know, Eugene Peterson, who is the translator of the Message Bible, which is a very user-friendly translation. I used to call it a paraphrase. It's actually not. It's actually a translation. Uh, Peterson was a professor at Regent when I was there. Uh, Peterson says, one aspect of the world that I've been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. <laughs> the internet. If I want to order something, I go online, I want to order it, and I'm going through it, I'm just getting ready to click, you know, purchase, and it says it'll be delivered in four to six weeks. I go, forget that. <laughs> to six weeks, holy moly. So I go to Amazon, and I've got Amazon Prime, and I can get it in 48 hours, even though I'm not going to be able to pick it up for three weeks, someplace in the States. Okay? That's the way we think nowadays. We believe anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume, I'm continuing with Peterson now, that if something can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. Our sense of reality has been flattened by 30-page abridgments. Readers Digest condensed books. <laughs> <laughs> there is a great market for religious experience in our world. There is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. There's that word patient again. Little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. It's an apprenticeship in holiness. Everyone is in a hurry. The persons whom I lead in worship, among whom I counsel, visit, pray, preach, and teach, want shortcuts. They are impatient for results. The Christian life cannot mature under such conditions and in such ways. Peterson wrote, wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, which is actually a phrase that you know, was part of the spiritual disciplines okay, in, the, in the old days. It's going to take time. It'll start being a blessing to you immediately. Now, it's going, to be, it's going to be work. It's going to feel awkward. It seems unnatural because the devil doesn't want it to seem natural at first. As you begin to get into this, it will be a blessing. You will grow in it, but it will take time for it to really make a significant difference. So, But the bottom line, to grow in your spiritual life, to have a more fulfilling experience of God, to become more like Jesus, you need to develop the discipline of Bible intake, of meditation on God's Word, of studying God's Word, of memorizing God's Word. If you do, we have received the promise that we will be blessed by that and be more like Jesus. It's, it's one of the very few ways that you can be guaranteed to get there. Okay? And I want to give you one more thing. Maybe I shouldn't put this at the end because it seems like I'm kicking you when you're down. But <laughs> R.C. Sproul is quoted in, in one of the books, which is... Absolutely on point. And the only reason for not doing this, there's only one reason you would not do this once you have been told how important it is, from Scripture how important it is. And it's this. Here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's Word, not so much because it is difficult to understand, not so much because it is dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. That's the only reason that I do this. And you are the only one who can do anything about that. The only antidote for laziness is to do it, whether you want to or not. Okay? Because it, it'll bless. Any questions? Comments? Yes, goes. Yeah, um, the memorization thing. I was in a group for quite a while, a small church group, and I think it was a Navigator's mm -hmm. book that we had. One thing about being raised Dutch Reformed is we're not good evangelizers. We're not taught that, how to do it. Right. But this book came with all these basic verses that we had to memorize, and we memorized, and we were accountable, and every Sunday evening we would go there and share and when we moved, I did not throw those verses away. Good. It just, it, they filled the void that I felt that I had not learned in that church growing up. Yeah, that witness and counseling thing. And they benefit us too, because we need to be reminded of the basis of our faith uh, often as well. You know, the Navigators are great. In fact, uh, 
Dawson Trotter, who founded the Navigators, is quoted a couple of times in one of these books, and, and uh, about the importance of doing this. And he was a truck driver for many years before he founded Navigators, and he would memorize a verse a day while he was driving a truck. Okay, and he would concentrate on that, and he, you know, that was his process, and that started the Navigators. Um, and they they have a thing in here where um, I think it's boring. Somebody told him, yeah, but that seems so boring to memorize verses like that. And he said, well, make the first 10 verses you memorize about boredom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. OK. Um, anything else? Marvin. Uh, one passage here that really touched me, and I, I'm going to memorize it. It's uh, by Richard Baxter about the discipline of meditation. OK, read it. <clears throat> he says, if by this means thou dost not find an increase in all thy graces, and dost not grow beyond the statue of common Christians, and are not made more serviceable in thy place, and more precious in the eyes of all discerning persons, if thy soul enjoy not more communion with God, and thy life be not fuller of comfort, and hast it not readier by thee at a dying hour, then cast away these directions, and exclaim against me forever as a deceiver. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. In other words, try this for the 21 days it takes to develop the discipline, and at least another week after that. You try this for a month and you don't feel the benefit of it, then stop. That's what Baxter was saying, and I would say the same thing because I'm that confident that this will change you in ways that you want to be changed, whether you know it yet or not. But you have to overcome the laziness. You are not that busy. I would venture to say there's nobody in here that's busier than me right now, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> okay. Um, and, well, I, I know, I know there's, com there's competition, right? But, but teaching three classes in a Bible study and leading a church and preaching and consulting for clients in the States, I'm, I have to get up at 5 30 every morning, okay? But yes, as busy as we think we are, there's still time for this. In fact, this is about prayer, but it has to do with spiritual disciplines overall. Um, it was. I think it was Martin Luther, was he the Luther account? I think it was Luther who said that I am so busy leading the Reformation, basically, leading the things of God, leading the church, that I cannot get them done unless I spend three hours a day in prayer. <laughs> Radical idea that the time you spend on this will redeem time that you're wasting elsewhere. Because you will be seeking God's direction and guidance. Okay. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Michael, would you turn that off?